the social media and then I hit send now. Only 15 minutes late. It's fine. We're only 15 minutes late. Well, 13, yeah. 13 minutes late according to my clock. It's not terrible. Sorry, you guys. I unplugged all sorts of stuff for Denver and oh, yeah. yeah, and then and stole cables and they were there were things in my suitcase still and my computer was turned off and I had to re-log into things and I was just like, whoa, this is not what I was ready for because mm. I haven't been in my office since uh, before I left. I haven't. I worked in the kitchen today because it was warm there. It's cold everywhere else. It's cold here. I know it's cold other places, but do you know what time it is? What? Three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 644, recorded on Wednesday, November 8th, 2017. Regenerating and transplanting. I'm Dr. Kiki, and today we will fill your heads with a multiple explosions, clumsy mammoths, and murder. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Tonight's show is not for the faint of heart. Although Halloween has passed, there are still plenty of things going bump in the night. What exactly is making the sounds you hear outside your window in the dark? Could it be an undead supernova stirring in its starry grave? Or maybe it's a mindless mammoth meandering after midnight. Are you frozen out of fear? or because a frightful fungus is forcing you not to flee. And while there may be a killer or two out there, wait till you hear about the one lurking much nearer. But not to worry, it's not all the stuff of nightmares ahead. We have science stories all sorts here on This Week in Science, coming up next. Got the kind of mind I can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a great science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back once again with all the science that we can fit into this show. And that is the truth. That's the truth. I feel like I just did this. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just deja vu. It's deja vu. Yeah. We had a show in the middle of all this. Went to Entomology 2017 in Denver, Colorado, and had a live show on Monday. Mm -hmm. So we are doubling up the shows this week. So much fun, everyone. But we covered insect news on Monday. This time it's going to be all over the place with science from everywhere. I've got stories about a sequential supernova cellular regeneration and some new skin justin what do you have yeah i've got a murder mystery evolutionary growth spurts and artificially sweetened septic tanks yum ew <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no blair what's in the animal corner well i have some clumsy mammoths i have very fast sperm and Sheep. Sheep. <laughs> sheep. Okay. All right. Don't be sheepish or, you know, you got you to gotta listen to twists. Don't be sheepish. But if you want to be like a sheep, follow the herd of those who are listening to twists. Before we jump into the show, I want to remind everyone, you can subscribe to the Twist Podcast on iTunes in the Google Play Podcast. Podcast Portal, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn, all the great places that there are podcasts. You can pretty much find us if you look for us. This Week in Science, we're also findable, searchable on YouTube and Facebook, and you can just find us at twist.org. 
But now it's time, oh, for me to remind you about our calendars. We are still taking orders for calendars. So if you go to twist.org, you can click on the calendar link for the 2018 Blair's Animal Corner calendar. It's a black and white calendar this year because it's for you to fill in with beautiful colors. You can do that. If you head to twist.org and you're interested in the calendar, someday you might get one if you order one, and then you would get to color it. And there's so many great things in the calendar, but you'll have to see for yourself. Right now, it's time for the science. We're going to get into it a little bit. Oh, my goodness, you guys. Did you uh, read about the, uh, the, the skin replacement this week? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. This is amazing, an amazing story. There uh, was a young boy, Syrian refugee, at the age of seven years old. He has a disease called junctional epidermolysis bullosa. And what this means is that the cells on the exterior of your epidermis do not connect. They're the proteins that link it to the supporting cell cells underneath, the basal layer of cells of the epidermis, those connecting proteins have malformations or they just don't form at all. And so the top layer of skin just kind of floats on top of the rest of the dermis. And when bumped or bruised or scratched, it forms horrible blisters because it's not anchored down. And so it just comes up off of the rest of the skin. This boy going through the trauma of becoming a refugee in the first place, he had an extreme reaction. He lost almost all of his skin. He lost almost all of his skin. And the picture is just heartbreaking of you know, this red figure. He's not covered in skin. He lost it. And doctors called a researcher and, and said, we know you've done some work before. These doctors in Germany where uh, the, the family had, uh, had, had run to. And they contacted a specialist, Michelle De Luca of the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia in Italy. And he has done small tests before with small patches of skin using autologous, meaning cells or from the person. So using autologous, transfected skin cells, stem cells. So they took a sample. This doctor said, this, this doctor, my, Michelle DeLuca said, okay, I'm in. They took a sample of stem cells from the remaining skin on this little boy's body and were able to grow the stem cells to create sheets of new skin. And they used a viral vector to introduce the proper genes that are not that not and contain mutations into those stem cells they grew the skin and then they transplanted it onto the skin on onto the boy's body over a period of of three surgeries to do it two years later this little boy has skin and it's not sloughing off it's not forming blisters they fixed it wow they fixed it. <laughs> this is an amazing, amazing story. And this gives so much, uh, I mean, it, the implications for this are huge in terms of treating burn victims, not having to take skin from, uh, from other people, being able to use sam a, a sample from the damaged in individual, being able to grow those cells. If it's just a burn, you can just replace the skin. But if it's a mutation, if it's something wrong genetically, the idea that it can potentially be repaired is fascinating. One of the other uh, really interesting things about this, this study is that uh, there's a big question as to it, how, this, how the stem cells work in this skin, in, in skin regeneration. And so they're wondering if the renewal if there's a large pop population of these progenitor stem cells that all produce new skin cells and create the skin, or if there are individual 
a smaller subset of these individual stem cells that create regeneration. And so the difference, it was hypothesized that if it's a large population of progenitor cells, you're gonna, if you sample the regenerated skin for genetic profiling, you'll find thousands of little mutations and differences because it would be all these different cells potentially contributing to the regenerative process. The other uh, alternative hypothesis is that if, it, if it's an individual, smaller group of cells, then you'd have only in the tens to the hundreds of these differences between the, the profiles of the cells in the skin. And that's what they found. So this confirms an idea of how the skin regenerates that we never have been able to confirm before also. Huh. Yeah. Wow. So there, yeah, individual stem cells that were able to be transfected, right? Mm -hmm. To be, get new genes put into them. And they, the, those individual stem cells are the ones that have continued to go on and continue to grow new skin for this little boy. So is this something that could replace skin transplant in the future? Um, potentially. I mean, if you can grow your own skin, you don't need to take it from a donor. Yeah, or, you know, face transplants for people that have gotten acid on the face or something like that, or a burn. That would really change things if you don't have to worry about rejection. Absolutely. What a game changer that would be. Yep. Yeah. So that's where the, that's where they're working. And, wow. yeah, the skin graft is uh, this it, – it's working. They're figuring it out. Now, the skin is a bit different from other parts of the body and it has its own quirks that – other parts of the body don't have. And so maybe skin is amenable to the more amenable to this kind of therapy than other organs, organ systems in the body. But even so, this is a huge step forward. And they say now the boy is going to continue to receive regular checkups for problems. But right now he's back to school, he's exercising, and he started to play soccer. Nice. That's amazing. That's a, a kid that had no hope for a normal life. That he is was now. He was going to die. He yeah. had no skin and a severe bacterial infection because he didn't have any skin. It was a systemic infection. And the parents basically said, let's try this because we have no other hope right. of our child surviving. And so they had a, uh, it was a special compensation or dispensation for them to even be able to do this experimental process on the child in the first place. But it worked. Transgenic stem cells regenerating an entire epidermis. You know, and maybe it's something, this is something that'll work really well on young kids. Maybe mm -hmm. it won't work so well on older individuals, but it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So I've, I'm, I've been reading about this this week and I've just been so excited about it. It's science. It's thrilling. And it has the potential to help so many. Other thrilling things, though, happen out in the universe when you look in the universe. And we've talked before about supernovas, right? What do we know about supernovas? What do you know? What do you know? Well, they're the they're the candlelight, the one in candlelight that we use to kind of tell how far away things are, because uh, right. they they glow with a certain radiance. They um, are an exploded star that did, uh, didn't turn into a black hole because it wasn't big enough. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Unless unless they do, which I think we talked about a while. <laughs> that might still be able to happen <laughs> later. Um, yeah, yeah, so they are the standard candle, and they have this super stars go supernova at the end of their life if they are big enough. They must be much larger than our own sun. Um, there's, they're usually somewhere between five to 50 or five to 75 times larger than our own sun. Um, you need a certain mass of hydrogen to be able to create the bright explosion that occurs during, uh, during a supernova. So researchers a few years ago, a couple years back using the intermediate to Palomar transient factory. They're using uh, this telescope at the Palomar Observatory near San Diego. And they saw what they thought was just a plain old regular type two supernova about 500 million light years from our planet. 
not a big deal. It's like, oh, a supernova. All right, let's look at it. And they kept observing and they're like, wait, this is a lot brighter than a normal supernova. Hmm. Oh, look, it's dimming now. That's great. And then they said, oh, wait, it's getting brighter again. What? And then, oh, whoa, it's getting dim again. And then, what? <laughs> wait, it's this thing is just ongoing. It's th this has been an ongoing fluctuation for over 600 days. They continue to observe it, and it is not acting at all like a normal supernova. Mm. This supernova that they have called IPTF14HLS holes. Catchy. Yes, very catchy. <laughs> Always catchy with the naming of these things. Yeah, it has been fluctuating and uh, has gone supernova. Uh, at least twice in the time, or apparently supernova as we look at the brightness, but it shouldn't have enough hydrogen anymore mm. to continue doing this. So I don't really know what is going on. And it also turns out that in an um, old picture by the Palomar Observatory from 1954, that it looked like there was a supernova in the exact same position as this star, as Wait this supernova. A second. Well, Wait what if a this second. piece isn't a supernova then? That's exactly it. it the, what they're thinking is that there are hypotheses that there are much larger stars that are absolutely massive somewhere on uh, the order of like 95 to 130 times the mass of our sun. So massive stars. And that because they have so much mass and then there is a, uh, they get really hot and they convert gamma rays into uh, electrons and also into antimatter. And so they think that it's this antimatter, positrons that get produced that somehow keep triggering partial explosions. And so huh. they have a, it's not a, because they're large, the, the brightness appears to be a supernova, but then it's not a complete explosion. It doesn't blow off mm. all the mass. And so there's still some stuff there, recombining. And then little mini okay, novas. Mini novas that look like regular novas. Because <laughs> it's in a really big star. Yeah. 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 So yeah. this is one idea that people have proposed historically, but some there are some things that don't add up for this also so they're kind of wondering maybe it's not even one of these large supernovas that maybe there's something else going on anyway the researchers are going to continue observing the star the location in space it they do say it is finally fading compared to where it has been and so maybe that means that it's done but they're going to keep looking because if it exploded in 1954 yeah. That means that they just have to keep looking because there could be some much longer term process that's underway that will rewrite our ideas about how large stars end their lives. I wonder if it's something that's like an in-betweener. Like yeah. much like like just below the threshold of just going black hole. But but a, you know, so where it's 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 going supernova and then it's like, I'm being drawn back into my own gravity. And then there's another supernova, although not as big maybe because some of the energy got away, but then I'm still so massive that I'm pulling everything back. Mm -hmm. and, but now I definitely not gonna go to the black hole because I've been expending all this energy, but now I need to, ah, one more. There we go. Now we're <laughs> there we go, let's do it again. <laughs> yeah, so we'll keep looking at the, oh, nimbly named IPTF14HLS and see whether or not it does come back again, whether there are further explosions, whether it collapses into a black hole even. Because if it's that big, it's yeah. probably going to go black hole at some point. Yeah. Or, or, or what if there is a stage where you just keep going supernova forever? Mm -hmm. like, right? like you're just too big to, to, to escape. Too, too big to fail. Yeah, too big to <laughs> Or too big not to keep failing over and over again. I don't know. I don't know what success is to a star. Uh, but, but you're so already that, a star. How can you be more successful than that? <laughs> you you just keep recapturing your own energy from that gravity, but still not enough to implode upon yourself. 
Yeah. Huh. Anyway. Interesting. Yes. So it's the, the star that will not die. The Palomar Observatory is going to keep looking at it to see what it means. What does it all mean? At this point, they don't know. This is This Week in Science. Justin, tell me a story, please. Oh, yeah, yeah. I should have one. Oh, and now for murder mystery. Ew. There's a killer hiding in the darkness, lurking under your skin, lurking and waiting, and then lurking some more, then taking a quick break, but then right back to more lurking. Thankfully, this lurking killer works for you. Immune cells, called killer cells, target unwanted bacteria that invade the body's cells. But just how they dispose of these malignant microbes is the mystery of this murder. Bacteria, as we've talked about quite a bit on this show, can evolve resistances to things. Right? Antibiotics, they work for a while, and then the microbe goes, ah, I know what you're doing. It changes its, its the defenses or attacks, and then it survives. Yep. Uh, there have not been, uh, they've not been able to survive the killer cells. Not very, not very easily, not very rarely able to evade these killer cells. This has caused researchers to become interested in finding out the exact mechanism that killer cells use to destroy bacterial invaders. One way that killer cells can trigger bacterial death is by inflicting oxidative damage. So you just stick some oxygen in there, I guess. And uh, but how do they kill cells in environments without oxygen? Now, for the first time, researchers have caught killer cells red-handed in the act of microbial murder, observing them as they systematically kill three strains of microbes, E. coli and the bacteria responsible for causing Listeria and infection and tuberculosis. The process inflicts bacterial cell death regardless of whether the environment contains oxygen or not. Their findings published in Cell reveal that killer cells act methodically, shooting deadly enzymes into bacteria to program a complete internal breakdown and cell death. So you've got this, this catalyst goes in there and starts tearing stuff up. Researchers from Boston Children's Hospital and Worcester Institute and University of Michigan used an equally systematic approach to make this discovery. This is a quotey voice of Judy Lieberman. We took three bacteria that are very different, and to see which proteins were destroyed by killer cells, we measured their protein levels before, during, and after they were attacked. Uh, Judy Lieberman, by the way, MD, PhD, Boston Children's Program of Cellular Molecular Medicine, is a co-senior author of the study. Proteins, of course, very important uh, in life. They direct the use of nutrients and production of cellular machinery that bacteria need to survive. And each strain of bacteria has about 3,000 proteins involved. Uh, about 5 to 10% of those proteins were slashed by the killer cells during this death-inducing enzyme activity. Uh, this, this enzyme they use is granzyme B, Lieberman says. If you made a list of the proteins that bacteria absolutely needed to survive, it would be a small list. Interestingly, it seems to be the identical... Uh, list that Granzyme B is hitting. This is the hit list that Granzyme B is using is the absolute most critical proteins for the bacteria. So our killer is is pretty targeted. Really, really, it's it's like all it's all like shots to the heart or headshots or something. You know. <laughs> it's out and there's a, uh, a wonderful infographic that goes with this story that imagines little monkeys, yeah. those little monkey wrenches getting in the, the way of the process. Yeah. Now, to <laughs> deliver the fatal blow, Granzyme B, uh, uh, the cells, killer cells seek out surface markers on the body's cell surfaces that might indicate a bacterial invader is taking up residence inside the cell. Killer cells then latch onto the infected cell and use an enzyme to create a small pore in the cell's surface through which they inject granzyme B. Once granzyme B gets into the cell, it passes into the invading bacterium, essentially destroys the critical prote proteins for that cell survival, as well as its ribosomes. It's very amazing. There's, there is a, there's a war going on in your body 
with assassin cells, killer cells going in and targeting and killing uh, things you don't want to be in you. So Good. I am glad. I'm glad that and, I have that, that Granzyme B is there. Yeah, and, and, and no matter how many times the researchers exposed the bacteria to it, they did not develop resistance to its attack. I suppose if you're that successful, one, it's hard to, uh, to come up with a resistance to it, you know. If, if a bacteria only sees it once and it's successful, <laughs> like there's, there's no retooling possible. Yeah, and it's also uh, if granzyme B is going after these survival proteins. I mean, one of the one of the strategies is you go after these proteins that are essential for the bacteria to survive. And if you break those, if you're able to dis disrupt those, then it, that's not something that the bacteria are going to get mutations in. Th those places are not hot places for mutations because if they mutate there, they'll probably die. Right, so, so so if you've killed off a whole population, it's not like selection has has allowed for a certain variation of uh, the genetic yeah. population to survive without those critical proteins. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's because so, there's because the proteins are so critical that evolution, natural selection, doesn't even really act on them anymore. Anyway. Yeah. It's it's if anything, it's doing everything it can to preserve them. Yes. <laughs> to make sure yes. that they're there every time. Right. Exactly. Yeah, so this is cool. So I love the idea. It's, now we know the proteins, maybe, or the targets of Granzyme B, and then maybe we can, like they said, get new antimicrobial drugs. Maybe this yeah. will lead to a new class of antibiotics. Yeah. Yeah. Granzyme B. I, get, I like the name of it, but it, I mean, it makes me think of like an old granny hip hop artist. <laughs> and it probably. <laughs> I'm Granzyme B. And I'm here to say, <laughs> Those I can help bacteria, bacteria in a savage way. way. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so we were both on it. Good job, though. You guys are awesome picking it up. That's a fun story. Hey, it's This Week in Science, but do you know what time it is? What oh, time oh. is it? Oh, I it's, think I do. It's time to get Blair's Animal Cornered. With Blair. <laughs> What you got, Blair? Oh, I have a lovely story about mammoths. And Justin. a cold. <laughs> yeah, I have a cold. <clears throat> I know. Yes, I've been excited to hear about this story. Yeah, I know Justin loves his mammoths, and they are rather um, majestic creatures. That is, unless they happen to be male. <sighs> Huh? Researchers who have sexed 98 woolly mammoth specimens collected from various parts of Siberia discovered an odd trend. Despite being a mammal and therefore most likely a 50-50 female to male sex ratio, give or take a couple points, seven out of every 10 specimens they found were male. Hmm, that's interesting. This creates a bit of a question mark in the fossil record, why were males being preserved left and right and females not? Well, it is highly likely, says uh, the Swedish Museum of Natural History, that the remains that are found in Siberia these days have been preserved because um, it is highly likely that they have been preserved because they were buried, thus protected from weathering. So why are males being buried more than females. Well, they hypothesize that males were falling through lake ice in winter or getting stuck in bogs. Hmm. Inexperienced male mammoths more often traveled alone, and the hypothesis is that they got themselves killed by falling into natural traps that made their preservation more likely. They were surprised they were looking into this because there was no apparent reason in that you would find in the fossil record a bias towards one side of the sex ratio. And so they really had to kind of put on their thinking cap. So everything they have found about woolly mammoths to this point 
makes it sound like their social structure was similar to modern elephants, with herds of females and young elephants led by an experienced adult female at the head of that kind of group. In contrast, male elephants that were not part of a group of elephants, forget what the collective noun for that is, they, uh, those other males lived in bachelor groups or alone. And because they were by themselves or in bachelor groups, you know how a big group of bachelors are, they were more likely to engage in risk-taking behavior. Without the benefit of living in a herd led by an experienced female, male mammoths may have had a higher risk of dying in natural traps such as bogs, crevices, or lakes. So that is just a hypothesis. Of course, we can't know exactly um, that all of these kind of conclusions that we drew are correct, but it is a good idea knowing what we know about elephants. What makes this particularly interesting to me, though, is that having a sex bias in the fossil record. This is something that we haven't really heard of before, but that's because you don't always do a gender test on fossil specimens of ancient species unless you need to. And so a lot of the, the studies that they were doing on these mammoth fossils, they needed to have the sex data to, um, to continue on. So this was kind of a... Um, a, a stop point that they needed to get to before they could continue with their data. And that's when they stumbled across this weird bias. So the question is, now that we know that fossil groups are not necessarily um, proportionally representative of a random sample of a population, does that change some of the conclusions that we've drawn about other fossil species in the past? It definitely could. I, the first thing I thought in this story is like, one, maybe, you know, being mammals, the males are much heavier and so are, are more likely to fall through ice. But I think your point was much, was, was much more likely the, the lone wolfing it aspect when you're, when you're with a, a, is it a pack, a herd? of mammoths a gaggle of mammoths are roaming <laughs> about yeah a murder of mammoths are wandering about um <laughs> there's there's probably some wisdom in the crowd you know you may have some matriarchs one or two in that that uh, that group of women who are, are females that are going around that are that have a little bit more experience have had have, have seen a male mammoth fall through the ice and know when you hear those cracks we got to go the other way um, so it could be a little bit of the, of the the yeah the the community sort of hive think together figuring out things and, and sensing danger. Well, hive think isn't usually matriarchal. Um, it usually is uh, node based. Well, yeah. So hive is not the right word. Yeah, <laughs> but so but yes. Yeah, so so the idea is that um, when left to your, their own devices, these younger mammoths were foolhardy and made risky decisions, which is something that we see in animals quite often. Is that the younger animals, when they're not with another group to watch the other groups, the rest of the group's decision making behaviors and and their kind of their thought processes, if you want to call them that, then um, they they do tend to make fatal decisions, which also is kind of the name of the game in natural selection, right? The mammoth that doesn't step on the thin ice survives to have babies. So that's the other question. Are we getting all of the failure mammoths in the fossil record? Hmm. And therefore, is that a disproportionate representation? Because we're getting all of the bad genes. Or, we yeah. only got the dumb mammoths. <laughs> we only see those hominins that were eaten by lions. That would Which, be like, we have well, a pretty no, different but that's, that's thing. different because hominids were preserved differently because some of them had burial rituals. Right. As well. It's very, my, different. It's very different. We only saw the ones that did get eaten by, by, by lions. We right. may have a different picture. But also, Justin, I want to mention that if you wanted to clone the mammoth from some of these fossils, you would get the dumb ones. So <laughs> that's right. Your idea of taking mammoths into the into the future with your Dr. Justin's mammoth park. 
going to be full of dumb mammoths. Super dumb mammoths that'll fall fall down constantly. Unlucky. We'll just call them unlucky. Just walking into walls and fences all the time. (laughs) Falling over their own tusks. (laughs) What am I doing? I don't know. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. What's up next? Yeah, the fossil record. Who knows? Um, So... Speaking of males, let's talk about sperm. All righty, let's let's do. It's been a while since I've talked about sperm on the show, but there's this very interesting article that came out last week um, from uh, the University of Otago and University of Canterbury looking at male salmon sperm. Male sperm, huh? of course. Salmon sperm, <laughs> swimming speed. And um, what they found was that males can adjust their sperm swimming speed when their social status or sperm competition risk changes. Let me say that again. They can adjust, males can adjust their sperm swimming speed dependent on competition in less than 48 hours. Interesting. Yeah. So what they found was and this is very important because these are uh, what do you call uh, spawn breeders, right? Or correct. Like, correct. They, or what is it? It's not spawn. Is it spawn? No, yeah, it's not spawn. spawning. Uh-huh. Were they broadcast spawners? Broadcast spawning. Uh, yep, yep. So um, these guys aren't quite broadcast spawners. Broadcast spawners are like urchins that just spit it all out and hope the current takes it. Uh, with salmon, the females will lay their eggs, and the males actually direct the the kind of the stream at the eggs so it's not quite a broadcast spawn but it does mean that multiple s- males can um, deposit in the same general area where there are lots of eggs so that's why swimming speed is so important and swimming speed usually is the defining characteristic for a successful uh, sperm in these salmon yeah you get there first you win Yep. Who's fastest? Right. Yeah. And so the way they actually found that out um, was they raced sperm <laughs> from two males to see who fertilized the greatest amount of eggs in a lab. Those males with the fast sperm fertilized more eggs and the seminal fluid from males with fast sperm sped up the sperm of the other males. So this is how they were able to find out. It's not the sperm themselves that's making them faster it's the seminal fluid that's making the sperm faster i like to picture it this might be too much like a slip inside right so like <laughs> it's just it's a quicker delivery system mm-hmm. Wee! <laughs> it would be like if you put lube all over a slip and slide yeah exactly it'd be a lot faster than just plain faster. old water mm-hmm. so That's kind of the way it works. Um, So they were able to identify that, first of all, they could adjust the speed based on nearby competitors, but also that that adjustment was made in the seminal fluid. They don't know yet what the component of the seminal seminal fluid is that makes it faster. But yeah, they said, uh, we found that when males change their sperm velocity via seminal fluid, this altered the number of eggs that they fertilized relative to a rival male. In other words, the adjustment of sperm velocity altered male reproductive success and therefore fitness. But what fa- what I found so interesting about this was that it happened in 48 hours. So I'd assume, as I always do, that it's all about hormones. <sighs> That's my assumption right. here. We don't know that yeah. yet. Right. But that sounds like... <laughs> What's going on that they uh, the, their testosterone kind of um, spikes because there's other males around competing and that in less than two days, faster sperm. Yeah. What would be doing it? What would be giving that energy boost? I mean, you'd think of it. You, I mean, maybe it's increasing enzymatic properties. So it uh, in, basically in that sense would increase the metabolism by making chemical processes faster. Or maybe oh, it's something that is, maybe there's actually an energy source that can go into feeding the mitochondria. Yeah. I kind of just assumed it was, um, it was purely mechanical. It could be purely mechanical. I'm just thinking of different options. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, but it could be, that's something I hadn't even thought about. I just assumed that it had to do with kind of the, um, the physical nature of the seminal fluid that made it um, a quicker channel for the sperm. But 
you're totally right. It could be creating a chemical reaction that is causing the sperm to move faster themselves. Mm -hmm. it is, this happens in humans too. I mean, not necessarily the speed, but the production goes up. Uh, we, this is one of the earliest yeah. stories that we talked about a long time ago where men who, who viewed certain types of uh, pornography uh, mm. were then like suddenly had higher sperm count like right. as a result right yeah. so there was something about the competition that 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 is sort of confronted them with that um well yeah and and um when you look at primates their uh the size of their storage space for the for the sperm and seminal fluid is larger um in proportion to their body size when there is uh when there are multiple mating events, when animals are not monogamous, um, then they they increase volume and sperm count because there's sperm competition going on. And that volume may be equal to or greater than the size of their brains. Hey, Kiki. So no, I've got this. I'm, but I was just looking up. I was trying to confirm yeah. my memories of how flagella work. Yes. They are powered by the proton motive force. And this is the flow of protons or hydrogen ions oh. across the bacterial cell membrane due to a concentration gradient that's set up by the cell's metabolism. So it's this could be something that increases the concentration gradient, that somehow the seminal fluid is leading to increase in protons. So the solution may be the solution. And the solution Kiki, the solution, yes. That's why you're the doctor. I was like, I've read something about this. Man. In the past. And, <laughs> that is and fascinating. I, and and as good as your uh, analogy was earlier about the 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 lube and the slip inside, I seem to recall <laughs> actually uh, experiencing this with Kiki at a graduation party where they had a slip and slide in the backyard and a garbage can full of lube for people to dip themselves into and then go and hit the slip and slide. And I think there was like blow up things or something at the, at the end of it to kind of slow you down or. Yeah. Well, we didn't want people to get hurt. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very slippery slip and slide. I will. You know, safety first. Were they wearing lab goggles? I wish. <laughs> right. Uh, actually, I think that might have been part of the getup. But the other part was, you know, this was a, a graduation party, so there was a bit of imbibing. And even for those who weren't intending to participate, after a while, the entire backyard was <laughs> coated in a layer of lube that made standing upright very difficult. <laughs> Oh, grad school. <laughs> That's right, loquacious one. It was a slippery slope. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Indeed. Well, anyway. Uh, anyway, it's Salmon sperm speed up in response to other males. That is interesting. And it is very possible that it has something to do with... Um, with the proteins with that it allow hydrogen ions to build up who knows Flagella. find out find out scientists we want to know why why does the flagella go faster and that is the end of the first half of this week in science we have more stories coming up but right now we're going to take a break in the second half we will be getting to bonobos we're going to be getting to artificial sweeteners in your septic tank so many questions, so little time. But stay with us. This is This Week in Science. Hey, everybody. If you are watching right now, thank you so much for watching. If you're listening, thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate you being here. We do, we do, we do. We couldn't do the show without you. And as part of that, there are lots of things that, ways that you can help twist 
keep going and doing the things that we do for you, bringing the science week after week after week. Right now at twist.org, we have got orders open for the 2018 Blair's Animal Corner Twist calendar. And this is a wonderful calendar full of original art by Blair that is black and white this year. It is a uh, departure from her previous beautifully colored calendars. This time the coloring is all on you. That's right. It's ready for you to color. It's a coloring calendar for hours and hours of fun and entertainment and appreciation. And this calendar, should you go to twist.org now and click on the link to order it, it'll come and it'll be full of all sorts of wonderful science dates throughout the year, including things, well, not so many, but twists. It'll remind you about twists every Wednesday evening, which is important as well. Great art, lots of fun coloring, and reminders about the best science days of the year ahead. So why don't you head on to twist.org, get your calendar now. We're, I can't believe it's November. We're ramping up to the end of the year already. Moving on from there, if you guys are interested in other, this will make a great gift. The calendar can make a great gift for the holidays, as a matter of fact. But if you're looking for other twist gifts, you can check out our Zazzle store. The Zazzle store has polo shirts and t-shirts and mugs and lumbar pillows and all sorts of fun things that are twist oriented for the people in your life who love twists. Or you can just buy yourself a little present because... We need to do that every once in a while. All the twist logos and the wonderful art from Blair's Animal Corner on a number of great items, and all of the proceeds go back to supporting twists. If you would like to find yet another way to help us out, there's this link on top that goes to something called Patreon. What's that? Well, Patreon is our crowdfunding platform of choice. It allows us to... Uh, to keep going month after month and for you to determine how you would like to support us. You click the red button, become a patron, and you can support us at whatever level of support is your choice per episode by the month. And you get nice little gifts and a special insight into what's happening on the show when you do sign up. So we hope that you give that a try. If you're not really into the whole Patreon thing, well, we have a little Patre uh, PayPal button it's on the side of the page, the main page. It says support, donate to Twist. Support Twist. Make a donation. Donate. And you click that. goes to a PayPal interface. Makes it really quick and easy for you if that's something that you are interested in doing to help basically executive produce this show and keep us being able to pay for the things that we need to keep the show growing and to grow it into something bigger, better, more sciencey, all the science you want every week. And from there, if you are unable to help financially, something that we would really, really, really appreciate is your help spreading the word about twists. That's right. Get on your social networks. Even get on the phone, send an email, start a conversation with somebody. Tell them about twists and how much you really enjoy listening to us week after week and why. Tell them about the cool science stuff that you learn. Help us bring more people, more minions into the Twist Minion Army. That would be just wonderful because the more we grow, the more we can do. And the more, the better it will be for you, for all of us. We thank you for your support. We really could not do this without you. So it's got to be good. And still, you can't believe what a skeptic I am. Believe in that shell. We disagree, but I still give a damn. And we are back with more this week in science. Oh, yeah, we are. And you know what I've moved to this half of the show now? Do you know? Do you know? Uh, what have you moved to this side of the show lately? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm moving it around to see where it fits best in the show rundown. But it is time now for this weekend. What has science done for me lately? From Minion Veronica Hayes. Science gave us science teachers. I was homeless for a time in high school, resulting in a myriad of issues, jumping from school to school. 
By junior year, I was sick of being placed in remedial classes due to administration not willing to determine what the different transcripts were saying about my class rank. I went to this new school asking anyone who would listen that I needed to be placed into AP chemistry. The amazing Mrs. Ward led the charge to let me take the class with a vet, which eventually led me to pursue my PhD in physical chemistry. Yay, Mrs. Awesome. Ward. Good for you, Veronica. Oh, it's a wonderful story. And Veronica, thank you so much for writing in and sharing it with us. Teachers are so important. Good teachers. Teachers who listen to their students, who respect their students, and really inspire them and help them to become the people that they want to be. Yeah, and what a tough time to go through and 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 to fight on for your education. That's yeah, and to, yeah. yeah, still want to be in AP chemistry. That's sure. fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you knew what you wanted to do, so it's amazing, yeah. Veronica, that you fought for yourself, and that was good work. Fight for yourself. Fight for yes. your right to do science. <laughs> and be proud of what you're good at too. That's something yeah. that's such a hard thing to learn because you're told to be modest and to not oversell yourself your whole life. And sometimes you need to just say, I'm good at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I'm not gonna that. I'm not gonna listen to the people who are putting me down or at least not helping to lift me up. I'm not gonna listen to them. I'm going to go, to go around and find a way to move forward. That's what I deserve. That's what we all deserve. Thank you again, Veronica. This is just, it's an inspiring story. And I hope many kids today have teachers as great as Mrs. Ward. Mm -hmm. Remember everyone, we need you to write in with your stories to let us know what science has done for you lately. What has it done for you? What does it do for you every day? Leave us a message on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash This Week in Science and, you'll, and leave us a message. Leave us a message in our message inbox, and I will fill the show, this segment of the show, with your stories. And we have done almost a half a year of this right now. I am just thrilled that we've had so many stories coming in. Let's keep them coming, you guys. Let's do this. Let's, let's do this. A whole year of it. I want it. I want it. Help me. Help me. Help me. Give me more stories, please. And now, Justin, what do you have next for me? What you got? I have a wide ranging new study of fossils. Uh, this was 311 species of hominin dating from the earliest upright species 4.4 million years ago, right through to the uh, modern day you and me type humans. Uh, that followed the last ice age. Published today in the journal Royal Society Open Science. Research shows that rather than steadily increasing in size, hominin bodies evolved in pulse and stasis fluctuations, with some lineages shrinking, even. Uh, they also suggest that sexual dimorphism, physical distinction between genders with females typically smaller in mammals, was more prevalent in early hominin species, but then steadily kind of got ironed out over time, disappeared. Hominins from 4 million years ago Roughly averaged 55 pounds, and we're just over four feet tall, about 4142. That was us, like fifth graders, fourth graders. I don't even know what that is. Like, that was humans. That seems skinny, though. That seems low weight for over four feet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with the dawn of our own uh, defined species bracket, Homo, about two million years ago, we had a decent growth spurt of eight inches. Uh, but only added 40 pounds. A uh, study found body size to be highly variable during earlier hominin history with a range of different shaped. We had like, there was the gorilla-like paranthropus, uh, more wiry, grace, uh, gracile, they're saying, Australopithecus afarensis. So even in there, there was more variation than just these things that I'm, I'm throwing out. Scientists were surprised around one and a half a million years ago, hominins grew roughly four more inches, uh, but didn't add any additional weight. This is about uh, the emergence of Homo erectus. And this is possibly because of endurance hunting that we were maybe getting involved in, where we would, because we, we could sweat and evaporate and sweat again and, and keep cool, we could run long distances. So we could chase prey that was much quicker than us 
and eventually catch up to it, force it to run again, eventually catch up to it, force it to run again. And then it would just sort of flop over from heat exhaustion. And we, like, we didn't have to be like really physical hunters. We just pestered our prey to death. <laughs> there, there are animals that do that now. There's humans that do that now. Well, but that's, but there's there's quadrupedal animals that that's how they hunt now as well. Yeah, just just having a better cooling system is sometimes all you need. Five hundred thousand years ago, uh, an average increase of twenty seven pounds, but not a lot of height gets packed on, possibly because we begin moving to cooler climates. Uh, Mediterranean being cooler, maybe there was some other factors in there as well. Putting us then, uh, that would be 500,000 ish years ago, at about five foot four, 122 pounds. Most of the size changes we see represented in humans now came about in the last 3,000 years. So it's, it's nutrition made a big difference, but we were ready. Like our genes were like, yeah, give me more food. I'll just get bigger. Give me, give me generations of this and I will just continue to get bigger. Let's see. So yeah, before before those uh, those early events, though, we kind of moved in concert uh, before adding on that that weight to studies authors. But uh, yeah, I think it's yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting that it didn't all happen at once. That it wasn't like I'm growing bigger and I'm also gaining weight because that's what you would kind of expect that increase in height would increase mass and that that would also concomitantly increase weight right oh, yeah we had different hunting tactics different yeah. things needs for survival we were moving to different areas and so things sort of change over there the the exceptions of course to this were homo naledi and homo floriensis which uh they they don't really know for sure if they were swimming against the tide of body size by going backwards at some point i think our our latest from homo floriensis is is really kind of ancient floriensis was the same size as the the hobbit folk that we found they were still floresiensis was on an island right yeah but they went back like like uh, much further uh in that area i can't, it's i don't have it in front of me but it's yeah they're 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 native to that area for a really long time and that dwarfism wasn't a sort of quick event because they there is no trajectory to that smaller however one of the other things is they may both be uh, just an offshoot more closely related to one of our earlier smaller uh, mm. uh, ancestors, right? So, so it may be that 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 the things that propelled a lot of, and this is of course many. There was at one point, you know, seven or more hominins going uh, on the earth at the same time. So there is, of course, the crossbreeding and all of that sort of braided stream effect that that's involved as well. Uh, yeah, very, a, a couple got the, a little smaller or stayed small. The rest of us kept finding, finding ways to, to get a little bit bigger. Get a little yeah. Bit fast food, you know, fast food and sodas. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the They're... biggest changes though, that's kind of also the interesting thing. All, all the, you know, you, you gain four, four inches in a million or two years. Uh, and then in 3000 years, uh, we've really exploded in our size. Like we're bigger than we've ever been before. And it's food, just from, food availability, from, right? Yeah, food availability, the invention yeah. of farming, you know, mm -hmm. these hunting, fishing techniques, all that kind of stuff. A steady diet. Steady diet. Way. Yeah. As opposed to the intermittent diet that mm -hmm. probably came about. Yeah. With nomadic people. Fascinating. 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 Well, let's stop talking about old people as in our ancient ancestors. Let's talk about old people and how we can make them young again. Oh. Yes. Okay. So resveratrol, right? We've known about this molecule for some time. And reverse it all. Reverse it all, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it's an antioxidant that is known to have potent effects. I mean, you'd have to really, if you were to actually get it from wine, you'd have to drink many bottles of wine to have it actually influence your cellular metab metabolism. But those uh, individuals, researchers who have isolated it and put it into pill form or even started using varying dosages of this reverse it all, 
I'm going to say it all the time, resveratrol, uh, on cells have really discovered that it does influence cellular senescence and aging and it uh, it seems to slow it down and can help to bring cells to a little bit of a younger state now one of the things that resveratrol is known one of the ways that it's known to work is that uh, it acts on or it it acts on splicing it's a splicing factor and these splicing factors switch things on and off and uh, they do decrease in cells as you get older. So they also knew that resveratrol, that it's not quite the right thing, that, that it's not quite right. You have to use large concentrations of it and there sh should have been a better way. And so they developed a bunch of novel small molecules, these researchers who published in BMC Cell Biology, that they call resveratrol analogs. And these analogs they used to determine whether altered splicing factor expression had potential to influence features of replicative senescence. And so they took uh, old skin cells and they treated them with the resveralogs, resveratrol analogs, resveralogs. And they checked, looked to see what happened to the cell cycle, looked to see what happened to indicators of aging in the old cells. And they found really cool stuff. They found increased telomere length. So the short caps at the ends of the chromosomes that get shortened as you age, they were suddenly longer again, long, healthy telomeres. These cells that had stopped dividing, that had stopped their cell cycle, that had gone into senescence and were just basically getting ready to die, they re-entered the cell cycle and started proliferating again. They started making new baby skin cells. <laughs> and, uh, they, and, and so they say this is the first demonstration that moderating these splicing factor levels is associated with the reversal of cellular senescence in human skin cells. And so there are other modulators like CERT1, CERT1, which we've reported on before, which is a target that a lot of people are really looking at for cellular aging stuff and anti-aging as an anti-aging target. And this study actually showed that in one, one situation, in one, of the, in one of the experiments that they ran, that CERT1 CERT wasn't even really required, that these resveralogs did all the work. And so it could be that the resveralogs are kind of triggering the CERT1 or similar pathways, and that the CERT1 might not be the target that people think it is. Hmm. Um, other pathways were uh, involved in the ERK, ERK antagonists and agonists, which is another, another uh, cellular metabolism pathway. But um, it's, this could be opening up these splicing factors that get affected by uh, resveratrol and its analogs that these could be targets to increase, that if we can increase these splicing factors, maybe cellular aging will de decrease. That said, this is only in a in skin cells in a dish. This is not anything else. But, you know, maybe it's going to lead to some nice face creams at some point, <laughs> if nothing else. <laughs> while, you were, uh, while you were telling this story, I, uh, I ordered uh, 12,000 capsules. So. <laughs> of resveratrol? Yeah. No, we'll yes. see. We'll see how it works. Yeah, I think I might start mainlining it. <laughs> <laughs> or at least just to tell me how it goes, because I probably don't need it yet, but... Uh, it's never too early to start. Yeah. <laughs> mainlining resveratrol. Yeah, yeah. We were we were watching those uh, smuckers, you know, everybody over 100 birthdays in the hotel the other day, and it's like, ugh, 100? That's nothing. <laughs> yeah, uh, researcher Professor Farragher from the University of Brighton, he says, at a time when our capacity to translate new knowledge about the mechanisms of aging into medicines and lifestyle advice is limited only by a chronic shortage of funds, older people are ill-served by self-indulgent science fiction. 
They need practical action to restore their health, and they need it yesterday. Yeah, that's old people now. We're talking about old people of tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> us. Yeah, Yay. you had your shot. Figure this out. <laughs> oh, no. All right, reverse it all. Bloop, 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 bloop. Back to you, Justin. What's your next story? Oh, if I have a next story, it must be about septic tank systems. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> Those things that make me throw the toilet paper away in the trash instead of flushing it. Right. These are commonly used in rural areas where the homes are not connected to a municipal sewer system. Uh, the the it's a primary treatment it removes the solids. The effluent is discharged in a septic drain field where it uh, goes, you know, its own sort of natural treatment, and then magically, all of your septic problems are gone. It's basically it's, when you have a septic tank, it's kind of the earth filters everything for you. Yeah. yeah, it filters it, except maybe it doesn't. Researchers from the University of Waterloo went looking for potential effluent contamination of groundwater and river waters, and they had a very hardy human specific tracer that they used to do so. They looked for artificial uh, sweeteners. Oh, I was going to say pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I, well, pharmaceuticals uh, can be found as well sometimes, but the, they break down much more so than artificial sweeteners, I guess. Wow. Uh, the study, which appears in the journal Environmental Quality, describes how the researchers tested private rural groundwater, groundwater wells and not the Swasaga River watershed, this is Canada, for four artificial sweeteners as a way to detect groundwater impacted by human wastewater being released by septic systems in the area. Artificial sweeteners, they're saying, are ideal wastewater tracers for humans as they exit the body essentially unchanged. And not, they're not completely removed by most water, wastewater treatment processes. Human wastewater contains relatively high concentrations of these artificial sweeteners, meaning, you know, like nothing else is containing this. That's why we have high levels because nature isn't consuming or distributing artificial sweeteners. Nobody wants to. <laughs> It's just us. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so this is the quote uh, of John Spolestra, uh, first author of this study, adjunct, adjunct professor in earth and environmental sciences at Waterloo. Although the four artificial sweeteners we measured are all approved for human consumption by Health Canada, it is the other septic contaminants that might also be present in the water that could pose a health risk. As for groundwater entering rivers and lakes, the effects of artificial sweeteners on most aquatic organisms is unknown. But the other contaminants that could be coming with this, uh, E. coli, viruses, pharmaceuticals, personal health care products, uh, and elevated levels of nitrate and ammonium. In, a conduct in conducting the study, they found that more than 30% of samples analyzed from 59 private wells show detectable levels of at least one of four artificial sweeteners and uh, indicating that the effluent has made it into the well water. <laughs> Estimates reveal that between 3 and 13% of wells could contain at least 1% septic effluent. Ah! Uh. Again, it has been somewhat filtered by the earth, as you were saying, but still. But still, but still, if there's septic effluent, that means there's probably some amount of sewage that's not being filtered. And maybe that's yep. microbes that were, are going to be dangerous to people's health. Maybe that's pharmaceuticals. Or, or, or maybe not. it's just artificial sweeteners. No, <laughs> no, or it could just, yeah, right. Or, yeah, that's all it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the team also tested groundwater seeping out of the banks of the Nadaswasasaga River and found 32% of their samples tested positive for sweeteners. Again, wow. indicating that some of the groundwater entering the Nadaswasaga River has been affected by septic system effluent. Previous studies by the same group revealed the presence of artificial sweeteners in the Grand River as well as in treated drinking water sourced from the river. Treated. So the treatment is not removing the sweeteners. What else isn't it re removing? Right. And it may be, you know, like 
It may be doing a good job on everything else. We don't know. These but sweeteners, they're, they're probably existing. very small molecules, right? Well, the, and the thing is, it does tell you, though, that there's a direct connection between, yes. between somebody's septic tank and that drinking water, which is not what you want. Yeah, not what I want. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Artificial sweeteners in the water supply. The artificial sweeteners. Daddy, daddy, the effluent is in the well. So if we just don't use artificial sweeteners, we can and just pretend we know nothing. That's that's exactly. It's, it's not what so much that, a problem yeah. with artificial sweeteners getting into the water. It's that it's that it just means that the influence is getting everywhere. That it's all one small world, and we're sharing everything, even our septic tank discharge. But sharing might be in our genes, in our ancestry. It might. How is that possible? It might not just be something that arrived de novo in humanity. That this ability to trust and share and help people might not just be something that humans have a capacity for. Research has shown that chimpanzees, when given the opportunity to help other individuals, strangers, if it's strangers, chimpanzees are really not likely to help a stranger out. People, though, will we'll help a stranger out from time mm -hmm. to time in the right situation. But we're able to do it. We do it, right? Mm -hmm. Chimpanzees really don't. They'll help individuals they know, but they don't help strangers very much. But a new study looking out of Duke University, looking at bonobos at Lola Yab, Lola Yab Bonobo Sanctuary in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo, they found that bonobos will actually help a stranger get food, even when they're not going to get anything in return at that point in time. If there's no immediate reward, they will still help the stranger get food. Yeah. yeah, and so the researchers had set up a kind of uh, interesting arrangement for their experiment in which they had uh, one subject in a cage unable to and un unable to reach food that was hanging from the top of the larger cage structure. Now, the bonobo, there was one bonobo outside of the cage, and the bonobo could go and release a stick that would drop the food to within, within arm's distance of the recipient. And so in the control situation, the recipient would never be able to get the food, <laughs> just kind of mean to the recipient. Um, but they gave, they had a couple of, of cage setups where the bars in one, in one arrangement allowed the recipient, the one who, who was looking at the food and couldn't reach it, they could reach their arm through the bars to kind of indicate that they were reaching there and that they wanted the food. And then in another situation, the bars were too close together and they couldn't reach. They just sat there and stared at it. Mm. And so they were looking at the difference in how often the bonobo, the generous bonobo, would help out the bonobo who couldn't get any food, the stranger. Would they not help? Would they only help during the situation where reaching was allowed? Well, it turns out that they helped a lot and it didn't matter whether the stranger could reach for the food or not. The bonobos on their, of their own accord decided to leave a toy that they were playing with, climb up the cage and uh, very often release the food for the stranger. Huh. More often in the reaching condition than in, um, than in the blocked condition, but, but still they did it. They released it. And so once again, this in innately human thing that separates us from the animals mm -hmm. doesn't so much. that it yeah. that it may be. I mean, this is our closest relative, the bonobo, and maybe this is something this trust and sharing that we have. Maybe it is something that came from the bonobos. Uh, they do think that they they discuss in the paper the possibility that uh, bonobos are 
not aggressive in general. They do have some stressful situations when they interact with strain with other groups of bonobos, but then everybody starts grooming or having sex and the females are in charge and then everybody gets along and it's all fine. So there are like some tense moments, but everything gets worked out without aggression. But this is beyond that. They, uh, they think that as bonobos entered in an area of the world, a habitat that where food was plentiful, plentiful, they uh, became vegetarians and not meat eaters. So they weren't hunting for their food and not having to uh, produce these hunting packs. Um, and that the situation over thousands of years that maybe they uh, evolved to be more trustworthy and to help out strangers more often. And that maybe that led to maybe somehow that we got it also. Maybe it got passed down. But yeah, so maybe you don't pull over to help the person on the side of the road because it's dark and they could be trying to murder you. <laughs> right. But when you feel like it's a populated area and an old woman is asking for help across the street, you're like, that old woman probably isn't going to beat me up. Let me help her across the street. I can help her across the street. I mean, there's yeah. being smart and there's being like, I'm going to go. Yeah, this is a bad situation. So, um, so here's a, here's my only question about this. Because as much as I, I loves me a bonobo and... Uh, I have more for this story. We're not done oh, yet. But okay, but just, just, just tell me this part. Is there in that in that first example, did they do that same experiment with with no other strange bonobo in a cage? Because... What if they just liked pulling a stick because it's the only thing they could reach and they were bored with what was in the cage? Like there's 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 an element of there's nothing else to do. You're in a cage. I get they threw the one toy in there and it played mm -hmm. with it for a minute. But if it if it goes over and pulls that stick to see what happens, even when there's not uh, you know, another bonobo in a in a far off cage, then then it would just mean that, you know, we share we share an interest in in novel objects and and not so much altruistic. Well, one could argue because they did it more when they were uh, reaching for it, that that had something to do with it, that they were trying to help. Oh wait, I guess there's more. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone's yawning out there right now. I was just yawning a little. Sometimes when we yawn, it's a contagious response that we have no control over. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's been shown that uh, that chimpanzees don't yawn in uh, response to stranger faces, faces they don't recognize. Oh, uh, so they put bonobos in front of screens with videos of uh, of other bonobos from the United States yawning or not yawning and just having a blank face. And they found that the bonobos contagiously yawned in response to videos of stranger bonobos yawning. Huh. Yeah. So they, and, this, un, this is, and so you ask the question of, all right, maybe they were bored and they're doing this thing. What it, what this, uh, this second part of the study underlines is that the xenophilia, they call it, the, the liking of strangeness uh, that bonobos evidence is there's part of it that is uh, unconscious that it uh -huh. is that there is a um, not a fear of strange faces yeah. and that there is a recognition of stranger faces and that they respond to them in in a similar way as they would to a friend or a friendly face that's cool Hmm. I, I yawn at, at reading the word yawn. <laughs> but we also... <laughs> Does that make me empathetic fun. towards? We've yeah. reported on the show about how with humans, supposedly, you are more likely to yawn contagiously. <laughs> we can't even uh, talk in about it. In relation to people that you, you care more about, you have more emotional tie to, the yawns are more contagious from those individuals. Yes. Yeah. From individuals that you care for. Exactly. So once again, humans kind of in the middle, willing mm -hmm. to help strangers, but only if it's safe. Yawning <laughs> contagiously to everyone, but more so to people they're familiar with. So there's this weird kind of mixture of these two extremes. I can't read Dr. Seuss's yawn book. Dr. Seuss's, Dr. Seuss's yawn, uh, no, uh, sleep book. 
because it starts with page after page of his little pictures yawning and it's i just start yawning when i say strangers i mean these were bonobos that the bonobos they were testing had never met before mm -hmm. uh, so not that they were weird strange <laughs> they're all wearing <laughs> fedoras and black trench coats <laughs> yeah so um yawning being used as a measure of positive social preference an implicit measure of positive social preference in bonobos and uh, that added to the fact that they um spontaneously helped unfamiliar bonobos out of their food situation adds to this idea that uh this human potential for xenophilia is either evolutionarily evolutionarily shared or it could be convergent evolution with bonobos and not unique. Just one more piece of evidence that we are not unique. But that hominids might be, rather. Yeah. Well, but but we've done stories about rats helping out other rats and stuff like that. I would I would argue probably not. But were they strangers? <laughs> Maybe some of them. I think some. Of, no, Where's you'll have to listen to previous episodes. Yeah, go back and listen to previous episodes. What we can't remember about them. No, I can oh, remember. Okay. I'm just not going to do an entire story right now that's not oh, from this okay. week. All right, let's finish up this show. I've got a couple of quick stories. Oh my goodness, it was discovered that a parasitic fungus, and one of these, you know, what we've called mind control parasites that gets into the insect and m makes the insect do weird behaviors. Um, this particular fungus causes the insect, usually ants, to immobilize themselves by using their mandibles to grab onto a surface somewhere. And then the fungus can make use of its entire body, use it as, um, as fodder for its future growth. And so researchers thought that it was mind control, right? This is all, all of them, get in there. It's parasitic mind control. Mm -hmm. No, this is worse. Oh, no. I mean, at least with parasitic mind control, you know, it's like, it's like dementia. Your mind is gone at a certain point and you don't know what's happening anymore, right? Uh -huh. In this situation... They did used electron microscopy and 3D reconstructions of host and parasite tissues to reveal that the fungus invades muscle fibers throughout the ant's body, leaving the brain intact, and that the fungal cells connect to form extensive networks. And these connections are likened to structures that aid in transporting nutrients and organelles in several plant-associated fungi. And so the what's happening is that the behavior is not brain down, this behavioral control. It's just physically controlling the muscles and forcing the muscles oh to do what it wants it to do. So and it's so, like a body snatcher, but it doesn't just mm -hmm. take, but it leaves your brain there. Like, yes, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry I'm doing all of these monster -y things because the... Yeah. And this has invaded my body, but I really I have nothing to do with it now. Yeah, this so so it's a. I mean, I I really from now on really want to think of ants and as not being conscious and or aware in any sense or form because <laughs> if I do now I'm going to be thinking about them looking at their mandibles clasping on to the surface of this leaf or tree and going why why and just knowing that they're going to die. <laughs> yeah this is there there are worse ways to die and that's one of them yeah yeah yep um in fun news though you can help name a world get in on the contest that the new horizons team is holding right now their next de destination the next de destination of the new horizons mission it's gone past pluto and it's heading out into the outer solar system out, out into the the frontiers of the Kuiper Belt. It's headed to an object called 486958 to 2014 Mu 69. 
it's also called Muse 69 for short right now, but they are holding a contest for you to vote, enter your name ideas, suggest nicknames, vote for your favorites. And in early January, the winner will be released. Uh, New Horizons is set to rendezvous with Mu69 or unnamed weird number name um, in New Year's Day, January 2019. Hmm. Hmm. Well, Bleak in the chat room calls Worldy McWorldface. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Go, so, go send it out there. I would say not that. <laughs> <laughs> and you can go to frontierworlds.org. Frontierworlds.org is the website where you can find information about this contest and do all the neat things. Nominate and vote. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Blair, what you got? Oh, I have some sheep. <laughs> that can recognize human faces. <laughs> um, a recent study from University of Cambridge trained sheep to recognize a celebrity's face. Um, the sheep correctly chose to learn a celebrity face eight times out of 10 um, in contrast to a random face. Um, then they had to show them the faces at an angle because really they were trying to see face recognition and face rec recognition via a photograph. So then they, they popped in the same celebrities, but their faces at an angle at an angle. Um, the sheep's performance dropped, but only by about 15% comparable to what the humans do when they perform the task. And then the final wrinkle, they actually uh, threw in pictures of the sheep's handler versus a random person's face. And uh, when the portrait photograph of the handler was interspersed randomly in place of a celebrity, the sheep chose the handler's photograph over the unfamiliar face seven out of 10 times. So, um, oh, this is the best part too. Upon seeing the photographic image of the handler for the first time, the sheep had never seen an image of this person before. They did a double take. The sheep checked for the unfamiliar, first the unfamiliar face, then the handler's image, then the unfamiliar face again, and then chose the handler. Hmm. So what you see here is advanced face recognition abilities um, comparable with those of humans and monkeys, and that they were really able to st understand pictures better than other um, mammals other than humans and monkeys that we've tested before. Um, so not only face recognition of humans, but face recognition of humans via a photograph. And now, now what they need to do is go back on that study and redo it, but reverse the roles and see if humans can recognize <laughs> celebrity sheep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like we would not do so well. I don't think we would do as well with the sheep as they did with these, I would, with these human fit. I'd love to know also if they've done this with photos of sheep. Have they had sheep Great question. recognize the faces of familiar? And, I mean, this is my mom. I'm going to choose my mom yeah. over, I mean... That's, that that even is a great study. question. Yeah. I did not see anything about that. I only saw human faces, but... Um, yeah, what a great question. Right. I mean, to, I mean, to us, all sheep look the same, but yeah. Well, and the yeah. basis for this study is actually pretty interesting. It's for uh, research on Huntington's disease um, because the way uh, sight and the brain uh, kind of work together in the sheep are um, are comparable enough that they're very commonly used for Huntington disease research. And one of the things that happens in Huntington disease is that um, they actually have problems recognizing facial motion in the later stages. So face recognition is a big part of um, studying this troublesome disease. So the more <laughs> the, the sheep can recognize faces, the better they can be used in research because they could actually give sheep what is essentially Huntington's disease in their brain and then test on them. Trying to fix it. System. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's, a, it's actually really exciting um, from the human element, what this means and how we can use that to make people healthy potentially. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So it's fun, but it's also helpful. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's good to know the helpful aspect of it for sure. Yeah. All right, Justin, do you have one more? Oh yeah, this is uh, just sort of interesting. This is uh, humans. We have cones and rods in mm -hmm. our eyes. And during the day, we're relying on the cones. At night, we're relying on the rods. And Some of us just have rods. In the twilight, <laughs> in the twilight it's a combination. Deep sea fish, those living many, many depths, hundreds of meters under the water, have only rods. They don't have cones at all. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this particular fish, though, they were studying that seems to be active at dusk and dawn close to the water's surface. And they had assumed that the retinas were composed entirely of rods. But when they took the closer look, they found something they hadn't thought was a thing. <laughs> they found rod-like cones. What? They were basically rod cones. They found uh, something different. <laughs> like a tapered rod? <laughs> it was neither rod nor cone. It's a new way. And so basically what they're saying is that uh, we may have there may be other paths to vision or other vision other vision uh equipment out there there's a, there may be more than just rods and cones and in, in maybe the fish world maybe other places that we we've overlooked the <laughs> idea um just need to look closer the scientists are suggesting more more comprehensive studies and caution are needed when categorizing photoreceptor cells into cones and rods study says hmm. so there's more variation than what we have seen in just our own eyes yeah. yeah keep looking for variation especially in fish in the deep dark ocean it makes sense that there would be some kind of adaptation to potentially help them because uh, bioluminescence in the deep ocean very often does come in colors so to be able to not just see basically in black and white would be a potential benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And interesting too, these are rod-like cones. Rod-like so cones. So it's maybe cones that adapted to darkness? To I darkness, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's fascinating. Fascinating. Thanks, deep sea fish. We wouldn't know about this without you. You guys, this is it for this week. This is our second show of the week, and we have done it. We've come to the end. Yeah, we made it all the way to the end. Thank you, everyone who's watching, everyone who is listening right now. Thank you for being here with us. Thanks, everyone, in our chat room. Hey there. If you're over on YouTube or Facebook, hi there. I see you. Thanks for watching. And thank you to Fada and Identity4 and Brandon for helping us make this show possible in the way that we do to you on a week by week basis. Thank you so much. I would like to also take this moment right now to also thank our Patreon sponsors. We have a few of them. So thank you to a Honey Moss, Aaron Luthan, Adam Mishkan, Alec Doty, Alex Wilson, Andy Groh, Arlene Moss, Artyom, Ben Rothig, Bill Kersey, Bob Calder, Braxton Howard, Brendan Minish, Brian Hedrick, Brian Condren, Brian Hone, Bruce Cordell, Byron Lee, Charlene Henry, Christopher Dreyer, Christopher Rappin, Columbo Ahmed, Craig Porter, Dale Bryant, Dana Pearson, Dale, Daniel Garcia, Darwin Hannon, Daryl, Dave Neighbor, Dave Wilkinson, David, David Friedel, David Simmerly, David Wiley, Donald Trump, the dubious, Dougal Campbell, E.O., Edward Dyer, Emma Grenier, Eric Knapp, Eric Wolf, Felix Alvarez, Flying Out, Gary S., Gerald Sorrells, G. Burton Lattimore, Gerald Onyago, Greg Guthman, Greg Riley, Haroon Sarang, Hexator, Howard Tan, Aluma Lama, Jacqueline Boyster, Jake Jones, James, James Donson, James Randall, Jason Dozier, Jason Olds, Jason Roberts, Jason Schneiderman, Gene Tellier, Jim Trapo, Joe Wheeler, John Atwood, John Crocker, John Gridley, John Ratnaswamy, Keith Crystal, Ken Hayes, Kevin Parachan, Kevin Railsback, Sonia Volkova, Kurt Larson, Larry Garcia, Layla Louis Smith, Mark Mazaros, Marjorie, Mark Marshall, Clark, Matt Sutter, Matthew Litwin, Mitch Neves, more Cowbell, Mountain Sloth, Nathan, Nathan Greco, Orly Radio, Patrick Cohn, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Phil Nadeau, Philip Shane, Randy Mazuka, Richard Hendricks, Richard Onimus, Richard Porter, Rick Ramos, Robert Aston, Rodney, Rudy Garcia, Saul Good, Sam, Shuwata, Sir Frankadelic, Stefan Insom, Steve DeBell, Steve Lesseman, Steve Mashinsky, The Harden Family, Todd Northcott, Tony Steele, Tyler Harrison, Tyrone Fong, Trainer 84, and Ulysses Adkins. 
Thank you, everyone, for all of your support on Patreon. And if you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience or just by clicking the Patreon button at twist.org. On next week's show, once again, we're going to broadcast live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time, twist.org slash live. You can watch online, join our chat room, if you want to jump in there, there's a bunch of fun in there, but don't worry if you can't make it. It's all right. All of our episodes are archived on YouTube and Facebook, and you can always find them at twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or if you have a mobile type device, you can look up Twist, the number four droid app in the Android Marketplace, or simply This Week in Science and anything Apple Marketplace-y. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That website is, of course, www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in your subject line, Otherwise, your email may very well be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up a shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, science, science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just that understand it. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming away. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Ay, 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 ay. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science 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 
it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science. Yo, 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 baby pops. Hey, hey, yeah, you know you can do it. We're gonna have an after show, but not really long because Blair's nose is stuffed up and I can hear it. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, Oh, kitties. You found kitties that you saved kitties, Bleak? Little kittens. I want to see the pictures of the kittens. Those aren't kittens. Those are cranky looking cats. Feed me. Meow. Look at those oh. cats. They're <laughs> cute, fuzzy cats. Oh my, they all are giving the devil stare. I know, aren't they? That's cute kitty. Kitties. My cats. They're cutties. Uh, There's my cutie girl. She's the one who doesn't like to be held as much. Uh, like, why is why does every episode have to end with a cat now? Because they claw <laughs> underneath the door because the door is closed, oh. and their little paws like attack under the door, and they make noise at me, and they they say, "Let me in, let me in." So my and daughter my and I were playing, and they follow me places. My four year old was playing a game where she would knock. And she go, oh, there's a vampire at the door. And then we go hide. <laughs> and then a little bit later, there's a werewolf at the door. And we go hide. And then I, I did one. I went, there's a cat at the door. And then I went, <laughs> and she's like, why are you hiding? It's a cat. I'm afraid of cats. What do you want? Did you see I sent you, I forwarded an email today from uh, a listener. Yes. yes. Fantastic. And, yeah, it's a, It's pretty funny. Yeah. The song about various parasites. Oh. Gandhi, I was right in there. It was great. It was terrific. (laughs) Vada wants to know more about the uh, trip. Oh, yeah. So so it was was an immersive environment uh, in which we were surrounded by uh, entomologists. Mm -hmm. Uh And, And it's just so fantastic to walk through a crowd and and hear things like, wow, yeah, well, good luck with your fleas. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, or, you know, oh, oh, yeah, I, I love your bed bugs. Those are the greatest bed bugs. Like, you know, have fun with those mosquitoes. My gosh, that's going to be ter- exciting to have. <laughs> yeah, do some good work with those mosquitoes. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really I'm fascinating. We had to, a group to, of you social use social organisms that were about 60 individuals large the things that and on some other level there was like this this sort of this sort of amazing thing of being around immersed in a culture that's dedicated to studying um, you know thousands of other species but a, a classes classes of species when uh, and they're all you know but not themselves like they're all like wait you're all humans who are dedicated to Studying species other than yourselves. I thought that was also somehow interesting. Yeah. <laughs> like there's well, a room full of ants I also, somewhere. I also love the humanology. Entomology is weird because so much of your study involves killing your study subject. <laughs> exactly. It, it does. It, it makes it very different from like studying giraffes. <laughs> yeah, but wasn't it that somebody who did, uh, was it Bonnie who came over to the table? for the our meetup for a, a quick minute. I think she said something about, she's like, yeah, you know, we're all entomologists and, you know, this is, I mean, 
nobody here is outgoing. Everybody's like just way <laughs> overstimulated. <laughs> you know, basically, <laughs> her her comment was that uh, everybody was ever everybody works with insects because they're not good with people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, and, and there is there was a trading so floor too yes. there was a, a trading floor and there was you know like the prices wow these are like uh i think is dr gem still in the uh in the chat yeah or the gem doctor is out there these is like like a, a gem trading or stone trading or a, a floor or if you're into baseball cards or whatever you know comic books trading floor like they had this one on the on the main floor of all of it you could buy like insects that were like you know had the little pin put through them and they it, ranged from like pinned pinned all these pinned butterflies and moths and insects they ranged anywhere from like fifteen dollars up to like seven hundred eight hundred dollars yeah. yeah and some were like amazing like that was that was just sort of fun because there's butterflies the size of you know a, a human head like there was like some really amazing specimens in there things that i didn't know existed or never seen or never googled or what have you but um but but even when you google something you can't tell that it's a butterfly the size of your head right <laughs> yeah um well so i was talking to my roommate who picked me up from the airport yesterday and i showed her the um the little calendar that we got with the with the fun pictures mm -hmm. and i noticed that there was a damselfly in there and then i remembered that our first interview said most people that say they have dragonfly tattoos, they're actually damselfly tattoos. I love that. Oh, and so we looked up the ways to tell the difference between a damselfly and a dragonfly. And uh, we were able, then there was like a quiz and we were totally able to tell. Um, and it's pretty interesting. I mean, the ones that I remember are that the damselfly have a very long, thin, like stick-like mm -hmm. back of their body. And the dragonflies are kind of stumpier and wider. And then um, their wings, uh, the damselflies like come into a point mm -hmm. and the dragonflies kind of bow out before they come in. And then damselflies um, rest with their wings up behind them like this. And dragonflies rest with their, uh, with their wings out like that. Well, so a tattoo, that, it's like, yeah, a tattoo, though, would be getting a dragonfly resting with the wings out. Right. Unless the wing shape, it's it sounds like the, the wing shape and the body shape are generally, usually damselfly shaped. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Here, I should do a... I'm going to go around and I'm going to check people. I'm going to, maybe we should start doing this, checking people's tattoos. <laughs> I know. This is something like... I've seen some that were animals that were definitely wrong too. And I was like, oh, your spider doesn't have enough legs or like <laughs> your octopus doesn't have enough legs or, um, you know, just other things that I'm like, uh, that's wrong. <laughs> um, but I don't want to tell them, of course. Right. Um, okay. So here we go. So let me see if I can screen share. So I'm already seeing a whole bunch of damselflies. I just Google search dragonfly tattoo. Oh, nice. So can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay. So this is definitely a damselfly because of the long slender body and, body. and the fact that the wings go into a point. They don't bow out. Um, they don't bow out at the, at the outskirts either. So then like. And then the one there is like a hybrid because look, it's got the long thin body, but it has the bowing. The third uh, one. Oh, this one. Yeah. yeah. So sort of those are more like dragonfly wings, but that's definitely a damselfly abdomen. Um, maybe. So this looks I've like a, a picture fly. here. Let me show you this picture here, of uh, that I. Wait, can you compete competitively be screen sharing? Yeah, so this oh. uh, this image here, they're saying that this is is a dragonfly, right? And that even though it has a slender abdomen the thorax is thicker uh-huh oh and the other thing was the eyes the eyes on a on a dragonfly which is it one of them the eyes meet at the middle and one of them they don't um yes yeah, so this is the eyes are broadly rounded and lie mostly flat against the head uh -huh. yeah yeah so, so this is a damselfly yeah, so like a lot of these I can see. 
Where Spherical. it's like this is this is more like a dragonfly for sure. Oops, sorry. I'm trying to do you, and I need to stop my own sharing. This is a damselfly, though. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I got my dragonfly tattoo. Here's no, dragonfly. I didn't. <laughs> There's a damselfly. No, that's a dragonfly too. Mm -hmm. um, but that's definitely. This is definitely a damselfly. Yep. Yeah, that one would be. Wow, that's fascinating. I'm going to be looking at them differently from now on. There's a damselfly. Yeah, they have more um, buggy eyes yeah. <laughs> than yeah, dragonflies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How funny. I love that. That's going to make looking at people's tattoos so much more interesting. That's a damselfly on your hand. Yeah. Oh, my God. I got a dragonfly. No, you didn't. I don't yeah. think that was a real tattoo. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it was a temp tattoo. We can hope. Oh my gosh, I am so gonna... <laughs> Look at this one! That looks like a flower! <laughs> that's not even... Yeah, that's more conceptual. Oh, that's boy. a conceptual dragonfly that's actually a damselfly, but conceptual. So this is definitely a damselfly too because of the way it's standing mm -hmm. and the eyes. Yeah. yeah. How funny... What happens if you if you uh, Google damselfly tattoo? That's oh, good, good question. question. Yeah. We get a bunch of dragonflies show up. No, those are actual damselflies for sure. Oh, there's a couple dragonflies, but mostly it's damselflies. Hmm. Interesting. I bet also some of them. They just went like dragonfly, damselfly as keywords. I bet most people were like, I really want a dragonfly and just didn't even look because they don't really know the difference anyway. Yeah, I don't think yeah. uh, for all intents and purposes, many people cared. No, thanks, Fada. I don't need a dragonfly tattoo. I'm all good. <laughs> I think I'm going to get one now. Now I'm inspired. Yeah, you totally I'm should. Get the right kind and be like, oh, nice damselfly. It's a dragon. No, this is a dragonfly. Right there. <clears throat> you should get a tattoo of a clumsy mammoth falling in ice. <laughs> that would be funny. I well, like no, it's it is important. We won't have any lightly frozen over water structure uh water uh areas in our dr justin's not a real doctor mammoth um yeah our our, our meetup was very small fada um dave friedall came we got to hang out with dave and then a woman named bonnie showed up there were a couple of people who had said they were going to come by but then we didn't see them so mm -hmm. It was a busy conference. People well, were very and, busy. And when we went looking for that rooftop bar later, um, we found that all of the universities were having their mixers at that exact time, which yeah. I think was the and other problem. Is we were like, go to a bar and pay for beer or go get the free beer at the university mixer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And mix with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> ben Rothig. Like, yes, tattoos of normal skin complexion. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fun. Dave Friedel has stories of me jumping in elevators, of uh, the usual, the usual drama between Blair and Justin. <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> I could summarize that. <laughs> Let's not revisit it. <laughs> we don't have to revisit it, but I can summarize it real quick. Oh boy! It goes like this. Hey, Justin, You're a can you not? Hey, I was raised by lesbians. You're a misogynist. No, I was raised by lesbians. You're a misogynist. No, I was raised by lesbians. And that's kind of the whole conversation. <laughs> no, yeah, don't talk over me. <laughs> that's kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, Ben. Drama. There was <clears throat> drama. It was, it was intense. We have no fun. idea. We did have fun. We had a great time. Denver got cold while we were there. It 
snowed on our last night. There was a little, little scattering of snow around in the morning when we got up and then, and then we left. Oh, but get this, you guys. So the travel agent that booked our flights mm -hmm. coordinated all of us so well. And it was like, all right, we're all basically leaving at the same time. It was like, go get on your planes. Justin got on his plane. I got on my plane. I sat on my plane and we sat on the plane for a little while. And then suddenly, shh, all right, everybody, we've got a mechanical problem with the plane. Everybody needs oh, to no. get up and take all their stuff with them over to gate B24. For, they found us another plane, so that's pretty good. But we're going to have to move. Oh, no, no, you were already boarded. That yeah, I was, waving. I was waving at that plane because I knew that was your gate. I could yeah. see the gate number from the outside. So I was like waving. I'm like, I don't know where she is, but I'm just <laughs> waving at the plane as I, as I taxied back. But I didn't see uh, your – because, yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, okay. <clears throat> As long as we have a working plane and we can get home, that's all. It, it was fine. I was only delayed like an hour, but yeah, we sat good. for almost a whole hour, which oh I don't understand. Yeah, because we were supposed to be leaving at what was it like eleven fifty, and I didn't get home till two o'clock California time. So that's four hours for a two-hour, fifteen-minute flight. And I was like, why, why is this taking so long? It's because they had scheduled us to sit on the tarmac for like 45 minutes. Oh, oh my goodness. Which I just, I'll never understand. I guess it's because, um, you know, they know it's going to take a while to board, but then they also know that they might get an earlier time um, on the departure lane, but they might have to wait would be my guess. I don't know. But so, that's that's what doesn't make sense is that the flight only takes two hours and 15 minutes but um and so we, but we got <laughs> in or still technically ahead of schedule like before our planned like arrival okay. time huh. but we sat around for 45 minutes before we took off so that's interesting because united has been dinged a ton for delays so uh -huh. maybe they're starting to like plan delays into their flight times yeah they're just padding all of their flight just times pad yeah. it with a little bit yeah Ooh, an electrical storm that sounds great good night fada um, um yeah, there was so a anyway. lot of uh of turbulence did you guys have a lot of turbulence a little i feel bit. like it's yeah. just Wait a bit. part of going to denver <laughs> you have to you have to go over the rocky mountains there's yeah. bound to be turbulence which, yeah, when I was a kid, I used to be terrified of turbulence. And now it honestly just puts me to sleep. <laughs> it happened to me again on the way home. I was telling Justin Kiki about this um, when we were in Denver. But again on the way home, we started hitting turbulence. And I just kind of like just fell asleep. Up. That's awesome. I was just being jostled to sleep like a baby in the back seat of a car. <laughs> which my parents used to um carry me around while they vacuumed and that would put me to sleep hmm. because of the vibration so there it is a little know. turbulence just like the vacuum of old <laughs> just like the vacuum that's right that's right um let's see we might have an interview next week i have to oh, confirm cool. it still uh there's a book called uh what's it called soonish I think, but it's um, Zach and Kelly Wienersmith. Is that, am I? Yeah, Wienersmith. Zach and Kelly Wienersmith. Zach is a geek cartoonist, and um, his wife, Kelly, is a scientist, and they've written a book about future technologies what what's coming hmm. yeah. so yeah uh we might not we probably won't get zach on the uh show but his wife kelly will probably join us neat which would be fun yeah she's a scientist anyway she's the one we want to talk with <laughs> yeah zach is so uh his comic zach's comic is saturday morning breakfast cereal if you've seen it it's pretty funny it's a good comic Hmm. Yes. 
So we might, I just have to confirm the interview that it's still happening. But that's what we might have next week. That we might. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. I got to roll. Uh, okay. So I'm going to say it now. Good night. <laughs> what? You broke know. you you broke up. You said good night. Oh. And then oh. you were nothing. Yeah. <laughs> good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Okay. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good night, Kiki. <sighs> good night, Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna hope that Blair's cold goes away as she gets yeah. some sleep tonight. And no great green globs of greasy grimy. Never mind. Gluppy glup. Gluppy glup come out of her nose anymore. Yeah. Everyone's yawning. That means it's time for some rest. Everyone who's on the East Coast, hey, Dick, tell you're late. Uh, we're just leaving. But thanks for joining us. I hope everyone uh, has a wonderful night's sleep. I will be getting the live podcast out probably tomorrow and uh, work on the audio and video re-upload for the video on YouTube. So it's a clean version if you want to watch it from the live show and then um, get the right, get this podcast out by Friday. We're going to do it. Double header this week. Maybe I'll put things on Patreon first. Oh no. All right. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next week. <laughs>